What makes a truss and a diaphragm similar to one another? Is there anything? Let's find out. What's going on Team Kesteva? This is Rich back here again with another PE example problem for everyone to make sure that we are getting ready for the upcoming PE exam. See you in there. Referring to the figure, find the maximum tension force at the bottom cord if the force is equal to 1,000 pounds. So obviously they're talking about that red arrow. We'll define it as F for force equal to 1,000 pounds. The length of span is 20 feet, four bays at five feet for each bay. This being a bay, not that kind of bay. And then that full span equaling 20 feet. So each bay is five feet. And the height of the truss uh, given is equal to five feet. So height of trusses we define as that. And that's going to be five feet. Cool. All right, so how do we want to break this one down? You might be thinking, oh man, do we do, got to do like method of sections or method of joints? And just, I know that's everyone's, that's everyone's favorite. I remember that was my favorite. Uh, I got the cold sweats, woke up in the middle of the night back when I was in college, just hearing terms like that, doing anything possible to avoid those trusses. But for this one today, even though you have a truss presented to you, it's a lot more simple than that. Keep in mind this one key fact that helped me in my journey to start to understand trusses is that when they talk about cords, that to me is the easiest thing to start to design and define for a truss. And you might be saying, what's a cord? No biggie, I got you. So we have a cord, that is the top member and the bottom member of your truss. So this is, you'd call that your top cord and your bottom cord. And what those do, those are your elements that, uh, that restrain your tensile and compressive forces in your, in your truss element. Because if we think about this just as a solid element, not a truss, so this is totally filled in. And again, I like to think of concrete beams when we're talking about cord forces. Because if you have a concrete element, we know that if you start applying a load and the member starts to bend, so you have bending stresses, you know that along the depth of your member, you are going to encounter tensile stresses at the bottom and compressive stresses at the top. And what that means is you're going to start to crack where those tensile stresses are in your concrete beam. So then we, we counteract those stresses with uh, reinforcing because steel is very strong in uh, tensile capacity. But those forces that you see for compression and tension on the extreme fibers of your concrete beam, those are equivalent to your cord forces in your truss members. So that T and that C for a truss is equal to your cord force. So how do we find those? The way that we find them is first, you want to find your maximum bending moment. So for this case, if we break down the statics, we have this going on. 20 feet, the bays don't actually matter anymore because we're just looking at cords, which are the top and bottom elements. You're not looking for any of the web elements there. So all the bays and stuff and diagonals and, and little intermediate vertical posts, those all just go right out of there. So see you later. Let's simplify this puppy. And we have a thousand pound force directly in the center of our beam, of our truss. So for statics, we know that uh, maximum moment, we'll just call it M max because there's no there's no uh, load combinations associated with this. They're not talking about allowable or uh, ultimate or you know nominal. None of that literature popped up anywhere. They didn't talk about live load or dead load. So none of that stuff comes into effect here. So we don't need to worry about load cases. So we'll just call it M max is equal to the equation P L over four. You might wonder, well, where the heck does that one come from? You know, I don't just know that off the top of my head. Well, I always like to grab my steel manual, obviously, and we have our shear and moment charts tab. 
Come on now. If you're not following, gone through all of my super secret tabs in my previous videos, so go take a look at those. But there's a condition just for this. Um, and so actually, I will uh, let everybody know that doesn't have it right in front of them. So this is ASC Steel Manual, table 3-23. All right, we're cooking. So we have all the, all the unknowns for our PL over 4. So let's plug that in. So M max is going to equal 1,000 pounds times 20 feet. Just watch your units. So we're going to be using feet, pounds and feet here, divided by 4. That is going to equal 5,000 pound feet as your maximum moment. Now, the way that you get your core forces is you divide your maximum bending moment by the depth of your element or the depth of your truss. So the depth of our truss, we know, is 5 feet. Now we just need to go, we'll say T, because I believe they're looking for tensile force, right? Let's see. Yeah, what's the maximum tension force at the bottom cord? Sorry, I, didn't, I always usually underline that. I didn't this time, so come on. You know, though. You underlined it. I know you all did. That's why you're there in those seats. That's why you're rocking and rolling right now, because you already know you're in the zone. You're in the mode. you got it going on. So T is just equal to M over D. That breaks down to 5,000 pound-feet divided by 5 feet, which brings us right back to 1,000 pounds. Now... The question might be, well, let's take a look. Green for answers. That's going to be B, my friends. But before you go, we want to answer that question. I hope you've been thinking about it. You've been noodling about in there. Are there any similarities between the design of trusses and the design of diaphragms? There's a very big similarity between the two that you should remember, and it's going to drastically improve your abilities and your confidence during the PE exam. And that is that for a diaphragm, let's say a big diaphragm, we're looking in plan view. This is the roof of a building and it's some length L and the building depth is some depth D. So, you know, we're looking from plan right now, which means that if you're looking at an elevation, if that's your that's your lovely building here. Ooh, little door. Okay, okay. Maybe a Starbucks. I don't know. That's your building. We're looking down at it right now. So we're looking at the roof of that building. And, you know, maybe maybe 3D. That's how good we're gonna get. Yeah. That is this view right here. And for lateral design, because that's what our diaphragms are there for, they are, uh, we call them our horizontal lateral elements of, of our building design, of our lateral system for our buildings. So if you have forces from an earthquake or from wind or whatever else, pushing on your building, aka, so that would be doing something like this, that building diaphragm ever so slightly is going to want to deflect like this and all of a sudden what does that start to look like that starts to look like a beam and we have discussed this in actually a diaphragm example problem for the pe exam uh, in a previous video i've done so i'm going to link that at the end and down below but you start to just get into what is defined as a deep beam or actually like a truss because you have now cord forces building up, tension, compression, in your big flat diaphragm. And that is no different than looking at truss. That's a terrible truss, but nonetheless, where you have a vertical force coming down. <clears throat> you have deflection like we had in this problem. And then you had cord forces, top and bottom. And you have a depth and you have a depth. So they are, they are one and the same. They're different applications, but they are the same, same method, same equations that you use to find chord forces. And it's the same nomenclature for each design. There are chord forces that you design for in diaphragm, and there's chord forces that you design for for your chord elements in a truss. Remember that. That one's pretty nice. That one's pretty crucial. 
And you might be saying, well, why is that so important? You want to understand that little basic component because when you start to get into more massive structures, like airports and bridges and high rises and, and more just larger scale structures, you will start to see that actually for lateral elements, engineers, structural engineers have actually used trusses for horizontal lateral uh, elements. They actually take a truss and they flip it on its side and that truss is solely there to move forces from, from lateral effects. Um, to shear walls, to braced frames, stuff like that. So when you look up and you see a, a truss that's actually flipped that side, you might be saying, what point is there in that? That seems so silly because in our minds, when we first start engineering, we always see a truss and we think of gravity only. That it should be tall and it's you know like a bridge and it's supporting gravity loads and stuff like that. But they can be used for both and they are used for both. And that is the principle behind them, is that uh, they can be used as diaphragms themselves because they are one of the same and they use the same equations. That's it, I'm done blabbering. I hope you all enjoyed it. Leave a like if you liked this video, but only if you liked it. And if you're still here and you're just soaking this up and you haven't subscribed yet, do yourself a huge favor and subscribe. Let's do this. Later team.